Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Sohel Tabazuri. Uh, I am the Leon Hess Professor and Head of the Elizabeth and Vincent Meyer Laboratory of Systems Cancer Biology. I also serve as director of the Black Family Center for Research on Human Cancer Metastasis here at Rockefeller. I'm delighted to be your host this morning for today's Women in Science program featuring my dear friend, Elizabeth Komen. Um, be, before I introduce Elizabeth, I would like to say a few words about Rockefeller University for those who are new to campus. So Rockefeller was founded in 1901 by John D. Rockefeller, who recognized that a major limit to preventing tre and treating diseases was a lack of understanding of the fundamental causes. Rockefeller was created to bridge this gap, embracing the credo, science for the benefit of humanity, which, was fueled by, which has really fueled our efforts for nearly 125 years. Rockefeller Labs conduct basic biological research to better understand the essential processes of life, health, and disease. The university's discoveries enrich human knowledge and create new opportunities to treat, prevent, and eradicate a range of human illnesses. Though many discoveries have been made here, Rockefeller is a relatively small institution. We currently have about 71 laboratories. So we don't have departments at all. Uh, each laboratory is led by a scientist who reports directly to our great president, Rick Lifton. This small, highly interactive environment enables our scientists from graduate students to postdocs to lab heads to pursue the most audacious research with the greatest potential for impact. Rockefeller is also a part of a vibrant scientific hub that extends beyond our gates to include Weill Cornell Medicine and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. We call it our tri-institutional or tri-I community. The world-class clinical and research facilities of our three institutions provide a stimulating environment for research and medical training. These partnerships also allow for strong collaborations with the tri-I. Uh, for example, I run a lab here uh, at Rockefeller University for, uh, where, where we study cancer metastasis, but I also attend as a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center uh, and collaborate, have the uh, amazing opportunity to collaborate with Elizabeth, uh, and you'll hear more of such collaborations as we um, have our discussion. So our program today is presented by Women in Science, a pioneering initiative that was founded more than 25 years ago to better women uh, research at the university, to bolster women's research uh, and researchers at the university. Uh, since that time, contributors to Women in Science have funded a robust fellowship program for women students and postdocs. More than 250 researchers have been awarded the coveted Women in Science fellowships, and I've had the great pleasure of training uh, many such fellows in my lab, uh, many of whom are here today. Um, so Women in Science has also helped recruit women to the faculty. Uh, it has provided funds for the expansion of the on-campus Child and Family Center, which is an incredible um, environment uh, that is really unique to our, to our university. And it's also established the Anna Maria and Stephen Kellen Women in Science Entrepreneurship Fund to encourage more women to realize the therapeutic potential of their research. So you can learn more about the achievements of women in science in your program. If you have not gotten involved with Women in Science Initiative, I urge you to do so. It is an amazing community of remarkable women who are passionate about learning how science is leading to better medical and health outcomes. So um, I, I don't think uh, it's really now my incredible pleasure to introduce our speaker to this morning's lecture. Um, uh, and I don't think we, ha we could have found a better uh, speaker for uh, the Women in Science Breakfast than Elizabeth Komen. Um, so she, Elizabeth is a world-renowned medical oncologist who specializes in breast cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She's also an assistant professor of Weill Cornell College of Medicine. She earned a bachelor's degree in history of science from Harvard College and her medical degree from Harvard Medical School. It was in medical school where we met as classmates, and uh, it, it, as you can, as you'll see, it, it, she's a force of nature. So when, the first time you meet her. Uh, you will you will you will never forget, and and I I do remember back in the day uh, when when I met Elizabeth and 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 all of us were just wowed by her. Um, so she then went on to complete her uh, internal residency training at Mount Sinai Hospital, and then her fellowship in oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, uh, where I was also a fellow. And again, uh, we we were able to meet each other, and over the years we kept in touch, and we t we spoke about sort of um, science and, and medicine and oncology and our, and our training paths. And, and it was just amazing because uh, I always had a sense that um, Elizabeth knew both the past uh, and 
and kind of had a sense of the future where things are going and, and medicine and limitations and challenges and, and, uh, and could sort of have, have a, a sort of a grand vision of the past and the future. And I didn't really understand why. And now, uh, having read her book, I understand that um, she, she's had an incredible passion for history of, of medicine, history of science, and, and had personal experiences about how uh, this, these um, medicine and science is skewed and has been skewed um, for, for millennia uh, away from women's health and, and, and how that creates uh, an atmosphere that is, is stifling uh, and limiting uh, our ability to achieve um, uh, optimal health outcomes. Uh, and and uh, so um, I'm just thrilled that she's here to t tell you about her book. Um, so what we're going to do is Elizabeth is going to is going to give a presentation. After that, we're going to sit down and 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 ask her some questions, and we're going to open it up for all of you uh, to have to ask Elizabeth questions. And um, you know, whatever questions you have are, are are welcome. So there's no restrictions. So whatever, think about your hardest questions because Elizabeth will be able to ha answer them. So Elizabeth, please. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. I'm really so um, excited to be here. And Sohail gave me this beautiful introduction, but the reality is we do go way, way back. But I have to say just a couple words. So there's two pathways at Harvard Med School. There's um, the, new, the new pathway, which is for those who know they're going to go into clinical medicine and um, you know, are very dedicated to the patient experience and, and clinical medicine. And then there's also the HST, MIT pathway, which is what Sohail did. And it's an extraordinary program that combines with MIT for literally the smartest people in the world. So you talked about meeting me, but when I met you, it was literally like, I, I think this guy's gonna, definitely gonna win a Nobel Prize, and I don't know, find a cure for every possible thing on the planet. And I wanted to stay in touch with him because I knew that I was going to see patients and that my mind was not his mind, but that one day perhaps we could translate the things that I was seeing with patients to clinically relevant discoveries, but we need minds like him. And so being able to work across the street, collaborate with him is truly a dream come true decades. I mean, we don't want to be that old, but kind of true um, about how we could collaborate. And, and hopefully we can touch upon that a little bit later because I think it really speaks to the coordination that is really rare in a lot of academia where you have doctors that are actually seeing patients and can say this is what patients are experiencing. What are you doing in the lab? What's happening with those petri dishes? What are you centrifuging? And how can we really make that relevant and, and meaningful to patients? So I'm, I'm very honored to work with you. Okay, so um, I'll talk a little bit this morning and then, and then we'll do a little Q&A. So um, let's begin. All right, so Sohail mentioned that, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move away from the podium, it feels awfully formal. Um, so I'm, I'm an oncologist and I treat breast cancer patients and what really fascinated me through the course of my career is that two women can have the same biological diagnosis of breast cancer but how they experience the disease is really inextricably related to culture, religion, society, history. And I am driven by the stories of patients, what helps them thrive, what helps them feel good in their lives, what, how do they access joy. And in thinking about this over the course of my career, I really became overwhelmed at times by the things that held women back. And often it was not their actually biology of disease, but perhaps the stories that they came to share with me the shame that they might feel about their bodies, the things that they were embarrassed to talk about, the diagnoses unrelated to their cancer that may have been missed over time, and why was that happening? Why was that still happening in medicine? So um, when you look at the data, the, it, is, it is unequivocal that women, and this is just talking about women's interactions with doctors, even young women, 46% of women report that they felt that their concerns with their doctor might be dismissed, that someone assumed something without asking them that may have been blamed for a diagnosis. And it's really extraordinary. So the title of my book is called All in Our Heads, The Truth and Lies Early Medicine Taught Us About Women's Bodies and Why It Matters Today. And the number of women when I say all in her head, have you ever 
been told that, so many women will say, you know, I, I felt this before. I've been called hysterical. I've been told, calm down. You're just anxious or you'll be fine, when really they were not fine. And the reality is this still goes on in patient doctor-patient interactions today. And it's not about men versus women. This can happen with female physicians, male physicians across the board. So what does this lead to women's health care? We know that, you know, whether it's Self Magazine or all these other books, that there are these 10-step guides to wellness. But are we really, what are we really chasing? And what are we really missing? And why is it that so many women are falling into this trap of, well, if you just take this pill, or if you just do that, you're going to feel better, when really so many women feel unwell? So again, I, um, I really was driven to think about how do we improve women's health care? How do we achieve a better sense of equity? So, so this slide here um, came up, I, I think I saw this a few years ago, about uh, women in various professions, right? So what, what's kind of holding women back professionally? And this really resonated and kind of went viral among my friends. But then I thought, well, what's the equivalent in our healthcare system of the unpaid labor that women experience? Not, not at home with the laundry and the cooking and, and the caring and the child rearing, but what, what's, what are the obstacles that are really holding us back for better healthcare? Who built the system? Why does it exist? And how do we achieve more equitable care. So I, I, I was talking about how I, I do believe that this whole wellness field is, is unwell, and, and it's not really new. So this is an advertisement from 1896, and it, it really resonates with, I think, some of the things you might see online today. Quite often the doctors, so this, was, this guy Pierce was really famous for selling these salts that were going to cure every problem in your life. Quite often the doctor is too busy and too hurried to make the necessary effort to obtain the facts. Sounds like something you could hear today. He frequently treats symptoms for what they appear to be on the surface when the real cause and the real sickness is deeper and more dangerous. And then, of course, he says, well, it's your feminine organs that are making you crazy. But the idea really being that how many times when we look at some of the, the supplement industry or the wellness industry, it's your doctor's not listening to you, but I will. Your doctor doesn't really understand how you feel, but I do. They haven't really figured out what's going on but I do. And then you have this $32 billion supplement industry or alternative industry. So what are some of the things that have been marketed to women? And then I want you to really think about what gets marketed to women today. So on the left, this is a woman suffering from constipation. And if only she had a clean system, she would have more charm and beauty, right, if she takes these salts. What about these hysterical women? This was marketed by a woman, Lydia Pinkham. She was famous um, for a compound that she created. These hysterical women crying, sobbing, laughing. She has no control of herself. The slightest thing that drives her to distraction, tired all the time. This simple remedy has benefited 98 out of 100 women who have reported after using it. What about this woman? She was the jewel of a wife with just one flaw. She wasn't using Lysol as a vaginal douche. Lysol was, was marketed for decades as a means for feminine hygiene to make sure that you kept your husband. All true. All right, let's keep going. So um, going back into history a little bit, trying to figure out where, where are the gaps, because people talk a lot about the gaps in women's health care today. Right? So one of the things that's really important to understand, and, and Rockefeller was e extraordinary in terms of medical science, is that the history of medi American medicine is relatively new. Before the 19th century, I mean, we didn't have germ theory, we didn't have laboratory science, we didn't have antibiotics. And the whole idea that we had these different subspecialties was really new. So the field of cardiology, pul pulmonology, gastroenterology, these were all fields of medicine that arose at the turn of the 19th century, 1910s, 1920s. And within that, you also fragmented the female body because, oh, so what about, think about the um, urology system, for example. When you think of urology, what do you think of? Like, really think about it. You think of mostly male doctors and male genitalia. I certainly did. But women also pee too, right? And we can have urologic disorders and very specific ones that are unique to women um, as they age, after childbirth. But many women still today don't know that that field even exists for them. And to understand some of these gaps, you have to go back in time to understand how the system was built and what, what really is missing along the way. 
And part of the problem is when we think about women's health and when Sohail and I were in medical school, a lot of it was the assumption that women's health was for gynecologists, right? It's about breasts and uterus and ovarian function and our reproductive fitness, when in fact we are head to toe different than men, right? We are not small men. And whether it's neurologists or gastroenterologists, it's essential that there is built into the system, what are those differences? What are the unique presentations of diseases? So when thinking about these gaps, it's why I wrote this book, my book, um, to really expand women's health beyond bikini medicine. So um, you can see some of the titles there, but really just breaking down by organ system and walking through history, what do we miss along the way, right? And this, um, I, I was trying, I, I know that Rockefeller has an incredible history of women in science, but that really is, was, not, um, was not the lay of the land. So I talked about the fragmentation of the body in the 19th century, but also there was the rise of medical science and before the 19th century, when it came to women's health, you know, there was generations of women caring for other women, just like there is today. But you had midwives, you had extraordinary groups of women that were caring for women. But the field of gynecology really arose as a group of men taking over and sidelining the midwives. At the same time that you had this rise of, of medical science, and I'm showing this woman that I found who in 1906, she was a school teacher, then she worked at MIT, then she worked in this lab, which is extraordinary, but again, she was one, um, she was a very unique woman in that sense. In most ways, women were excluded from medical school, they were excluded from science because their brains were gonna be too overstimulated and, and they needed to divert that energy to reproductive fitness. But part of that meant that midwives who had centuries, you know, thousands of years of knowledge did not, learn about, did not learn about germ theory, did not learn about many of the new medical science techniques that were evolving. And as such, they were sidelined. And so much of gynecology and these other fields of medicine became taken over by the men that built the system. So this is just a little bit of some of the things we're going to be. I'm mindful of time because I want to make sure that we have time to talk today. But these are just some of the things, gaps to think about. So it was not until 1993 that women were even required to be uh, included in NIH-funded clinical trials. We'll talk about some of these things today. 80% um, of autoimmune diseases are in women. But it, number one, before I wrote this book, I didn't know that fact. Secondly, do we consider that a women's health problem? I probably didn't in my mindset, but yet it is. What about the fact that Alzheimer's disease is two times more likely in women than men? I didn't know that, and I know that SOHEL works so much in that, in that area. Or the fact that it was not until 2016 that female mice were mandated to be included in research by NIH. And we'll, we'll talk about why that's, are you okay, is she okay, are you okay? Um, we'll talk about why that's, why that's relevant for the science that's conducted today, even in my field of cancer. So what are some of the gaps that I just want to bring up that, that are beyond what we would normally think about as women's health? So autoimmune diseases, 80% more likely in women than men. Alzheimer's disease, two times more likely in women. Lung cancer, the number one cause of cancer death in women, and it's rising among women who are not smoking which again, I didn't know being siloed in my field of breast cancer. Heart health, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women. And I wanna talk a little bit about the history of cardiovascular disease and why it continually gets missed when women go to emergency rooms today. So a little bit of a provocative slide, but let's go for it. So when you go throughout history, and when Sohail and I were in medical school, and, and even still today, when we learned about anatomy, the only times I recall, and there's data to show this, of a woman's body being shown is when you're looking in a textbook at their reproductive function, either their breasts or their, their reproductive function. But when you're learning about the heart, the lungs, the GI system, it was always on a male form. And that's a lot of not so subtle messaging over time. But when you look throughout history and you go all the way back to the Greeks, the idea was that women were inverted, imperfect versions of a man. And you can see throughout history how that carries through even to today. You can't have textbooks if you're just showing the man all the time for all these non-reproductive functions. And the only time that you show a female body 
is to show her reproductive function. When I was actually Googling images, I'll show you later on, to show the toxicity of immunotherapy, every single picture that I saw was of a male body, not of a female body, right? The reference body is the 70 kilogram, often white male. So what you have here on the left, this is a picture from a famous Renaissance anatomist who really exploded the field of anatomy in the 16th century. Before then, it was very hard to do actual dissections of cadavers because there were all these uh, church rules about why you couldn't um, dissect a human. But this is what Vesalius drew as the vagina here on the left, right? So this was the inverted, imperfect version, right? Everything was tucked in in the woman and hidden and shameful, whereas men were, um, if you think back to the uh, four humors, they were hot and dry, and so everything could be extruded from the body and displayed. And it was not until 2005, anybody know what this is? This is a 3D model of the clitoris, which has been lost and found in history so many times is extraordinary. A number of men who claim to find it, rediscover it, name it, but it was not until 2005 that a female urologist actually did a 3D model of it. In, in 1948, Gray's Anatomy, a famous medical anatomical textbook, didn't even include it in there. So we wonder why there's an orgasm gap. Let's keep going. All right, moving back to one of the other gaps, who gets heart disease? So this is Sir William Osler, famous, famous guy. He uh, did so much stuff at Johns Hopkins. He founded the whole residency system and really made extraordinary advances in medicine, okay? But what did he say about women's heart disease? Because I really wanted to understand why is it that so many women's heart attacks are missed over and over again when they show up in an emergency room? So I went back in time and I read some of his original documents on women and heart disease. So this is a classic statement that he says. He's describing a woman here. The patient was evidently very neurotic. She had no heart disease, no increased tension, and no sclerosis of the vessels. Her heart spasms were caused by excitement and emotion. The extreme rarity of true angina, chest pain in women, must always be borne in mind. And then he goes on to say that every single woman that he presented, that presented to him with chest pain, had neurotic angina, neurotic chest pain. And he even says, these women do not die. These women do not die. But yet, we know today that heart disease is the number one killer of women. How does he describe men? Well, he says, it's not the delicate neurotic person who is prone to angina, not those crazy women, but the robust, the vigorous in mind and body, the keen and ambitious man, the indicator of whose engines is always at full speed ahead, all well-set men from 45 to 55 with a military bearing, iron gray hair, and a florid complexion. Think about who gets heart attacks in the movies, right? It's the guy who's working on Wall Street, he clutches his chest, the elephant on his chest, and he falls down, he's having a heart attack. We don't see women, even in the lay media, as having heart attacks and what those symptoms look like. So the symptoms of heart attack are actually quite different in men versus women. And when Sohail and I were in medical school, the way that heart attack symptoms were described were atypical. Women's chest pain is atypical. That's actually the term that was used, right? But how are we atypical if we're greater than 50% of the population and it's the number one killer of women? This is when language becomes so important, when history becomes so important, because you see the legacy that shows up at the doctor's office, in the emergency room, for patients, for physicians, and why these gaps persistently exist. You know, I wrote this book, and it's got these crazy, crazy egregious stories from the past, women in asylums, this and that. But I think what's even more dramatic for me is the insidious ways that it shows up in the doctor's office, the insidious incuriosity about what makes us different and why these gaps exist. So these are some of the other facts about coronary artery disease. Um, heart disease kills one woman every minute. Breast cancer is every two minutes, but one, every minute. This is just looking at some of the, just 4.5% of the 444 million 2019 NIH coronary artery disease, uh, coronary artery disease budget went to women-focused research. What is going on here, right? Look at, look at here, 19 cents per woman, $4 per man. It's, it's extraordinary. It's really extraordinary. And the way that we present with chest pain is not only different, but how our vessels, our image needs to be different as well. Let's talk about mental health, okay? This is a big one. So this guy, Henry Cotton, in the 1920s, the New York Times said was, was just absolutely extraordinary. He was going to fix all the crazy women out there. 
At this hospital in Trenton, New Jersey, under his brilliant leadership, there is on foot the most searching, aggressive, and profound scientific investigation that has yet to be made of the whole field of mental and nervous disorders. There is hope, high hope for the future. So I went back and read what this famous guy said about mental health. He was really quite compassionate in the beginning. He said, you know, these women that are being put into straitjackets and taken care of by these terribly oppressive nurses, this is terrible. I have a better idea. Well, he knew that if you had a fever, you might hallucinate. So why were so many women hysterical and crazy? They must have what's called a focal infection somewhere. Where did he think these infections were arising? Their teeth. So these women that were brought to various asylums in the 1920s, thousands of women, he would forcibly, and these could be women in their 20s, forcibly remove their teeth. Oh, hold on. Forcibly remove their teeth. They would have no teeth for the rest of their life. Now, and they would have to wear dentures. If that didn't work, he would remove their gallbladders, pieces of their colons, and potentially their uterus, and potentially their ovaries. He claimed an 85% cure rate for these hysterical women, when actually there was a 30% mortality rate. But he was allowed to continue for decades because you know, he was solving terrors of insanity. Think about the 1940s. Many of you may be familiar with the lobotomies that were performed on, on um, one of the Kennedy daughters, right? And, and she was permanently um, altered for the rest of her life. So Walter Freeman predominantly did these lobotomies, severing the frontal lobe. And it was predominantly in women who were presenting with a whole host of ills. It could be insomnia or anxiety that he was treating with, with these lobotomies where he was, they were doing an ice pick through the eye up into the frontal lobe. What about the 1960s, right? The rise of tranquilizers and anti-anxiety uh, drugs. Battered parent syndrome. Now she can cook breakfast again when you prescribe this medication. You can't set her free, but you can help her feel less anxious, right? So it really made me think, how many times are women told today, you know, you're just really anxious, you're a new mom, you're tired, your joints hurt. Forget about the rheumatologic autoimmune disease you may have. You may just be anxious and need an anti-anxiety medicine. So what about the antidepressant use today? I'm not saying that there isn't a tremendous role for mental health and antidepressants, but when you look at how they're prescribed, how they're marketed, Women are far more likely to be demonstrated and advertised to in, in advertisements for antidepressants and mental health medications. But also, when you look at postmenopausal women, that's where you see the biggest rise of antidepressant use. Yeah, many of these women are having a lot of complaints that could be treated in other ways. They have sexual dysfunction, they have joint pain, they may have hot flashes. It doesn't necessarily mean that they need an antidepressant, right? It's because we're not really unpacking what are the symptoms that they have how can we treat them in a more specific way? And in a lot of instances, far too many women are being overprescribed antidepressants. What about how we exercise? Okay, I'm mindful of our time. I'm gonna go through a few more slides. So um, this was a favorite of mine, thinking about, I don't know if any of you do what sort of exercise you ladies do, but often there's this fear of bulky muscles, right? I was looking at this Pilates class the other day and the frequently asked questions for this new Pilates studio. And I was like, don't worry, ladies, you won't get bulky. Why are we so worried about having bulky muscles? Where does, where does that come from? So at the turn of the 19th century, bicycles were the rage. It was an incredible hobby. Think about the first time that you could ride a bicycle. You, could, you were free, right? But what did that also mean for women at the turn of the 19th century? You had mobility from your home. You didn't need a man to take you anywhere. You didn't need a horse and buggy. You, too, could explore without anybody else but you and your bike. Well this was a problem for society because bikes also became a symbol of the suffragist movement. So doctors necessarily became moral arbiters of what women could do in terms of their exercise. This might not make them feminine enough. And well, look at this woman in the middle. She could have bicycle face. What was bicycle face? Literally, Journal of American Medical Association. I promise you, you can check the citations. I read all of these articles. Debate about bicycling for women, pros and cons. What was it going to do to them? What was this concern about this boogie woman character that never actually existed? She would get bulky muscles. Her face would be frozen in a grimace because of exertion. Only women, by the way, OK? That's a terrible thing. But you know what the worst thing that was going to happen? Brace yourself for it. You were going to masturbate all the time on this bicycle, OK? Like, so all these women loving Soul Cycle and Peloton, well, that's why, OK? And um, here, this is Cambridge University. 
So when they went to uh, admit women at Cambridge University, this just shows you how much medicine and society, it all kind of comes together. When they wanted to protest, what did they do? They hung an effigy of a woman on a bicycle outside of a window, right? This was mobility, this was freedom. And then you had doctors saying, oh no ladies, you can't do this because you're gonna look like this lady. You're gonna be too bulky and your face is gonna be frozen and my God, you know, the other stuff we can't even talk about. So where does that leave the female athlete today? I tore my ACL ligament to my knee when I was 14. Saw a famous orthopedic surgeon um, and he said to me, well, let's, let's just see how active you become. I don't know that we need to repair this. Let's see how active we become. I was an athlete, I was a dancer, and it was not until five years later that I had other injuries to the knee that I finally had it repaired. But when we think about it today, women are nine times more likely to have these ACL injuries than men, and we still don't really know how to teach them how to jump, how to cut, how to strengthen their muscles to help avoid some of these injuries. Concussions present very differently in women than men and can have more longstanding problems um, for women. We focus so much on helmet safety for football players, which is incredible, we should, but what about concussions in women? We don't hear about that very often. And sidebar, you know who's most likely to get concussions? Domestic violence patients. One out of every four women in the United States suffers from severe domestic violence from an intimate partner in the United States. Many of these women, when they call 911 or they're in an emergency room getting stitched up, can't give a good story about what happened. It's not because they're drunk or they're high, as often is assumed in an emergency room or by a police officer. It's because they've been hit in the head, often multiple times and repeatedly. And that can have long-standing chronic effects, not just for the immediate moment, but for their mental health and for their, their neurologic function over time. So there's all sorts of fields of medicine that need to catch up with what we're missing, whether it's from a social standpoint or even just how women play sports and how we address that. So doing just a little bit on breast cancer because I want to make sure. So we know breast cancer is not a new disease. Um, this, I just, I'm fascinated by also not just history and medicine, but history and art. And there are some medical sleuths that have gone back in time to try to find some of the original depictions of breast cancer when maybe these painters didn't even know. This is a woman who has a retracted breast on the left, also on the left here. I, um, I happened to see this one in person and it's quite, it's quite remarkable. But um, when you think about the history of breast cancer, it is also inextricably linked to who was studying it, how we understood it, and the minds that were asking the questions about how we treat it. So breast cancer surgery, you may be familiar, this is the Halstead radical mastectomy. Halstead was a famous surgeon at Hopkins who um, pioneered this idea of the radical mastectomy, which included not only removing the breast, but significant musculature of the pe pec um, pectoralis underneath. What's really interesting when you read about the history of breast cancer is, yes, there was all this effort to cure, but there was far less attention about, could we do any less surgery? Did we have to do these radical mastectomies? The idea, and bringing it back to the original slide, that the idea of treating breast cancer is not just to cure somebody, but to think about how they live, what makes them thrive, how they find joy. This was a famous radiation oncologist who just simply could not understand, um, and he was one of many who said, you know, I, I don't understand. We, we are frequently amazed at the therapeutic passions aroused by what is an affliction of a superficial, easily disposable, utilitarian appendage, right? So when I went back to think about what happened with the history of breast reconstruction? Who, who started the idea of implants and how do we help women feel better in their bodies after this diagnosis? This is Timmy Jean Lindsay. She's the first woman to receive a breast implant and opens one of the chapters in my book. She didn't have breast cancer. She was a divorced single mom of many children who worked in a factory. She had tattoos on her, um, on her chest that she wanted removed. She wanted her ears fixed. She went to this local plastic surgeon who had been noticing that <clears throat> it developed this new technique because he, when he found the blood transfusion bags that were in plastic bags, he said, oh, these feel like breasts. I, and he was really into this idea that women should have larger breasts. And so he convinced Timmy Jean, and it's interesting to see her interviews throughout history, that, that she needed breast implants. So the history of breast implants really goes back to this woman that wanted tattoos simply removed from her breasts, from her, or from her chest wall, from her ex-husband, having nothing to do with breast cancer patients or anything like that. Now, of course, today we have many, many different types of reconstruction, implants, different types of flaps. 
but when I was interviewing women today and, and taking a step back and thinking about my patients, there is still so much shame that women feel about their bodies. I, I had one patient who worked on a farm. She had raised like 16 kids and she had come to me with her mastectomy and she had this um, artificial like plastic nipple on her breast. And I said, Mary, what, what is that? And she said, well, I, I put this on for you because you know my scar is so disgusting. And I thought, here's this beautiful, amazing woman who's so resilient, so strong, who's seeing her breast oncologist thinking that she needs to put a fake nipple on her scar because I'm going to feel uncomfortable. How many women have shown up in my office apologizing for sweating or saying, I'm so sorry I didn't get a pedicure today or shave underneath my armpits or shave my legs? Like, do I have to do that when I show up to take care of you? Why are women feeling so un uncomfortable in their bodies still today? So um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go through the rest of these slides pretty quickly. But when we think about it was not until 2016 that we even tackled the idea that many of the research about cancer was not even being done on female mice, but male mice, right? And how did that limit our understanding of treatments today? When we think about chemotherapy treatments or immunotherapy treatments, women are 30% at higher risk of severe side effects from cancer treatment compared to men. Immunotherapy is really new in the history of breast cancer treatment and other treatments for cancer. And women have a 50% increased risk of serious side effects compared with men. This study just came out last year. Why are we just figuring this out now? Whereas anecdotally, many of us would have told us that. And I think it has a lot to do with how we've studied cancer treatments and how we haven't fully listened to the patients that we're taking care of. This is just another slide. In the blue, you can see this, just the idea that with chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, or any therapy, women in, shown in blue have far more symptomatic toxicity than men. Let's talk about hormones, right? So a lot of what I do in my practice is decrease the amount of estrogen that can interact with a cancer cell. <laughs> the discovery of hormones is really fascinating in this country. And, and in Europe, because there was this idea that, well, there's going to be one thing that makes men really awesome, right? And there's going to be, there's got to be something, some hormone that makes women crazy. So this was Dr. Brown Sicard. He was 72, felt that things were a little slowing down, didn't have the same vigor that he wanted. So he started crushing guinea pig testicles and injecting himself with them and claimed this whole idea that he was now more virile, he was stronger, he was better, but um, he really launched this whole field of the discovery of hormones and ultimately hormone replacement therapy. This is um, just a cartoon where he's showing this kind of tired tiger that's gonna be injected with this elixir of life to help make him stronger and more vigorous. But what's really interesting about this binary discovery of hormones throughout history is that men make estrogen and women make testosterone as well. But when you think about the idea was that there was going to be one thing for men and one thing for women still limits, limits our understanding of hormone therapy today. We have no clue how to give women testosterone therapy, and we're just beginning to think about how to be, give women hormone replacement therapy. Initially, when hormone replacement therapy came out for women, the idea was all women should be on it. Then we ping-ponged in the 1980s and 90s that every woman was going to get breast cancer from it. And during my training, it was an absolute no-no because everyone was going to get breast cancer. And only now we're trying to figure out, can we give women hormone replacement therapy? Can we even give it to women who have a history of breast cancer? We don't really know the answers to that question. And I believe it goes back to this mindset of not really thinking about what women need and also the assumption that they were going to be bucketed in two separate categories. So for my patients, for example, <clears throat> I treat many, many young women who we have to thrust into early menopause, women in their 20s, in their 30s, and um, not just for the general population, but all of these issues that women may go through, it really boils down to the history of how we treat breast cancer has been so much about, yes, making sure women are alive, but are we really helping them survive? Are we really help helping them thrive? We think about sexual function, we are two times more likely to ask men about sexual side effects from cancer-targeted therapies than we are women. It's simply unacceptable. There's no world, one of the gynecologists said to me, there's no world where we would be castrating men for years and years and years and not giving them testosterone back or doing studies to think about how we could give it back. And yet only now is there this groundswell to think about 
Can we give vaginal estrogen? Of course we can. We can give intravaginal estrogen to these women. It can be hugely, hugely helpful, and it does not increase their risk of breast cancer recurrence. Why is it that we're just publishing that now in 2024? So let's say, I just want to end with a couple other things. Let's say you don't care about women at all and you don't care about women's health. We all know that we are the primary caregivers. We are the primary arbiters of making decisions for our health care. And we are the primary consumers of health care in this country. So one of the things I say is even if you don't care about women's health, I hope that you do, it actually redounds to our society. This was a study done by um, Women's Health Access Matters Now that's showing just a $350 million investment into research could generate a $14 billion economic return to a productivity and global workforce. So it's not just that it's the right thing to do to help women, but it actually redounds to a better, healthier society on every front, even our economic front. So I want to finish also with the White House Women's Health Initiative, which is really exciting if many of you know about it. So Jill Biden uh, and, and President Biden announced initially $100 million, but now $12 billion to start to think about how to close these gaps, that women's health is not just bikini medicine, but to really understand head to toe from the early start of the lab to what's clinically relevant for patients, what are we missing, and how do we drive that research forward? So with all of that, I know that there are a lot of really powerful people in the audience today. I started with my job and, and really the privilege of hearing extraordinary stories from my patients that drove me to write this book and to do this research. I really do believe that every body, every body that we're in has a history. My hope with this book and that this work is that when you, when you come to learn about the history, when you come to think about the experience of, of women past, present, can you start to change a story about yourself? Can you think about what are those questions that you never asked your doctor but always wanted to? Can you think about the stories you may have heard from families, friends, history, culture, about what your body deserves, what it's worth? And can you start to change that narrative for yourself? I think about for my patients and the questions that I ask them and, and what I hope to help them achieve to really thrive in life. For my science collaborators, which Sohail and I can talk about, how it's so important that women have a seat at the table so that we really listen to women. It's not just about increasing the number of women physicians. It's about listening to our patients having women be part of the discussions about what our symptoms are, what are our concerns, what are we actually feeling in our bodies. And with that, can we start to have a better, more equitable future in terms of our health care. And so I'm really privileged to have spoken with you today. I thank you for this platform, and I know that we all share in the mission of improving women's health. Thank you for your time. Are you going to chat? Yeah, okay. So. Sorry, I went a little over. No, 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 of course. We have time. We'll, okay. stay, we'll stay as long as we need to. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's, uh, it's really my pleasure now to um, ask, uh, uh, the plan is to ask uh, Elizabeth a few questions and then open it up to the audience. Um, and I'm sure a lot, a lot of you have a lot of questions and, and uh, <laughs> that not only her seminar brings up, but also her book. So, uh, so Elizabeth, you know, before we talk about your book, I, I want to talk about your um, other passion, which is breast cancer. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, we've we've experienced, we've all witnessed a lot of um, tremendous progress in the past few decades, both in terms of reductions in breast cancer mortality, uh, improvements in, as a result of improvements in screening, uh, the advent of targeted therapies that are really helping our patients live longer and and increasing cure rates. I was wondering if you could tell us, uh, in your mind, uh, what have been the, what, what you view as the greatest advances, uh, ongoing advances, recent advances, and what you envision the next 5, 10, 20 years uh, as um, opportunities and areas that you're really excited about in terms of breast cancer yeah. uh, treatment. So we could talk about this together. Oh, hi. <laughs> we recognize you. Okay. Sorry. Hi. Okay. Um, so uh, that's so fun when you see people that you don't expect to see. Um, all right, so I would say three different things. One is definitely genomics, genetics, targeted therapies. This is particularly with patients with metastatic disease, patients who have disease that is spread beyond the breast. It's really extraordinary. I mean, I feel like every day I'm trying to keep up with the trials and, and just the genetic landscape of our ability to target what, what evolves in a cancer. One of the things that's been really unique and, and so important, and we can talk about liquid biopsy, is the ability to monitor cancers over time. 
so that it's not just the cancer you developed initially, but for metastatic disease, how did that change over time and how do we target that with better treatments? And that's really allowed women to live longer and live better. I think the more we can avoid very toxic chemotherapies, it's, it's really changed dramatically women's lives. The rise of immunotherapy has completely changed the landscape of how we treat a lot of cancers, including breast cancer. But within that, within the, the evolution of our improvement in how we treat breast cancer and improve outcomes, there's also been this evolving attention to quality of life. So cold capping, so that's the idea where you can put a cap on your head and decrease hair loss during chemotherapy. That's actually a big advance that's helped a lot of women feel better in their diagnosis so that when they're looking in the mirror, they actually see themselves looking back at them. It's not just that they've lived another 20 years, but that they have not disrupted their psychological state as much in the process. So this other attention to quality of life, sexual health, physical health, exercise has really changed how I think women are living with the disease and doing better. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, and so in terms of, uh, since I think a lot of us have, you know, we know that with respect to screening, since our medical <coughs> training, guidelines and recommendations for breast cancer screening, yeah. self-screening, um, these have changed over mm -hmm. the years. Uh, and also, um, so since everyone's here, we'd yeah. love to hear from you, an expert, uh, what what are the you know what are your recommendations yeah. regarding screening for the average woman screening for women who have family histories of breast cancer <laughs> screening for BRCA yeah. mutation carriers um, so we, yeah. yeah so so the problem in in this country is that there's been so much ping ponging and back and forth from different medical societies about what women should do if you ask almost any medical oncologist this is what they'll tell you. Starting at age 40 for average risk women, you should start with a yearly mammogram, likely in combination with an ultrasound because most young women will have dense breasts. So you need the combination of both. But if you have a strong family history and you really may need to talk to your doctor about this, which includes not just your mother's side, but your father's side, it may be important to start screening earlier than that. Um, the way that that's calculated, there's a breast cancer risk assessment tool that helps us calculate your overall lifetime risk of breast cancer as well as five-year risk. Women with a greater than 20% average risk of lifetime breast cancer are usually eligible for a breast MRI, and they will get those yearly under the, could be over the age of 40 or under the age of 40, and that's really important to know. Um, and then with respect to BRCA screening, I mean, I think we probably agree almost everybody should, should have genetic screening, but that's not always covered by insurance. But talking to your doctor about your family history, because it's not just about BRCA1 and 2 screening, but other genetic um, concerns as well. There's also been debate about uh, self-breast exams, which I think is ridiculous. I think your breasts are on your body. You should know what they feel like. The ideal time if you're menstruating to do a self-breast exam is after your period when your breasts are less tender. If you're not menstruating anymore, then picking a time once a month to do that is really important. Over 14,000 women under the age of 40 are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. They're not getting breast, they're not getting imaging because in most instances, they don't know that they have a family history or they it's coming up because even in the absence of a family history, it still happens. That is a huge unmet need in our scientific world, in our society, because why are these women being diagnosed and how can we how can we catch it sooner? Because if you're only catching it on physical exam or these women doing self-breast exams, it's often larger or with axillary lymph node involvement. And we want to be able to catch breast cancer when it's much, much earlier, which is why the work you're doing is so important. Fantastic. Um, so, uh, you know, you talked about your own personal experiences with physicians. We've all had personal experience with physicians, our families and, and situations <coughs> where the physicians get it wrong, the physicians don't listen. Um, can you talk a little bit about advocacy like how yeah. do you you know tell the audience here how do they advocate for themselves when they when when they encounter a physician who's not as you know as uh, you know as as sensitive and as uh, thoughtful uh, as you um, how do you uh, how do how do how should one advocate for themselves in this in this current system it's really hard i mean i think even even in the best of circumstances we have an imperfect healthcare system you may be only seeing your doctor for 15 minutes they may be great but they may be rushed it's really, really, really hard. Um, at the end of writing this book, I had a medical experience that I talk about in the conclusion where despite all my advocacy, despite all my resources, despite all my energy, which I thought I had in me, when it came to something that happened to me, I apologized, 
I didn't want to bother anybody. I suffered far too long with something that could have been fixed way earlier, ended up in the hospital, and it was, and I, and I listened to multiple people who told me that what I thought I had was not the right thing, but I had something else, which I didn't have. And it was really um, a, a horrible but eye-opening experience about just how hard it is to access better health when you need it. I think one of the most important things when you're, especially if you have a new diagnosis or if you're really worried, is bringing somebody with you who can, I don't care how smart you are, I don't care if you're Einstein, when you're anxious, it's incredibly hard to absorb new information. So bringing a, a set of questions, having an advocate with you is really important. Also knowing in this complex ecosystem, who's on your healthcare team, right? It may be a nurse, it may be a nurse practitioner. Do you have to use the portal? Should you call? Sometimes it's really hard to get in touch with the office. It's, it's very, very frustrating. And even the doctor doesn't have control of all of these things, but asking in advance, how do I get in touch with you and who is going to be getting back to me is really important. With the Cures Act now, you can also get all of your information sometimes on my chart and get it before your doctors even had a chance to receive it. That can be really, really overwhelming. It's medical information without context, without compassion. You also want to talk to your doctor about how you want to receive information. Do you want your PET scan released before your doctor has seen it? Some patients don't want that. Mm -hmm. um I, I could go on, but uh, I want to open it up to the, to the audience. So um, we have roaming microphones, uh, and uh, please, questions. Yes, we have one here, and then up there, and then one here. Yes. Hi, thanks so much. Great talk. Um, I had a question about BRCA analysis. Is that state of the art, or is it polygenic risk analysis now? So there's some, I, I, it is state of the art. I mean, in terms of what happens in clinical practice, um, if someone certainly has a family history or goes for genetic testing, they're almost never going just for BRCA1 or BRCA2, but a whole panel of you know, 90 genes, depending on what they present with. In terms of polygenetic risk, we are not, those models are not used necessarily in clinic. What will happen is if someone has multiple genetic risk factors, then we pull that together as an individual. But it's still these tests where it's just coming up as one gene versus another. Um, hi, thank you for that, that was amazing. I'm curious how you think that the insurance companies deal with women's health. Like when you tell about breast, uh, you know, your breast exam um, yeah. and mammogram, usually if you want a sonogram, they're like, oh, we don't cover that. But yeah. how do you think about women in, in the insurance industry? Well. Now that there's FDA mandated language to even tell women that they have dense breasts so that they need to get an ultrasound. So it really has to be covered by insurance. But the insurance is a huge thing that I only learned about in the last few years. So <clears throat> when it comes to female specific things like um, I'm going to I think it's um, genitourinary pelvic floor. I forget the exact title of it, but you have to have these CPT codes. CPT codes are how you can bill for things in medicine. The problem is a lot of these codes don't even exist for female-specific disorders. So women are treating them, they can't bill for it. If you speak to a lot of the gynecologic surgeons, if you look at what this almost the same exact surgery for a man versus a woman, you can bill much, much higher for a man. So what happens is, is gyne gynecologists and gynecologic surgeons are the most underpaid and the least paid surgical subspecialty of all of them. Because, they're, um, because of the insurance codes and some that don't even exist. The other thing that happens with, with women is that often we are seen as the ones that will listen longer, which we do on average. Doesn't mean that men can't. We're just expected to be what's called the mom consult, handle the difficult patient or take longer with patients. Gastroenterology is a very interesting example of this. Women tend to want um, colonoscopies done by women. They also take longer in women because women can have more torturous colons. So if you're a female physician caring for many female patients, if you're a gastroenterologist, you're spending longer with your patients, you're taking longer to do the colonoscopy, you're seeing less patients as a result of that, and therefore making less money, but also making less money for the hospital, seen as less productive and less likely to be promoted. So it's a vicious cycle. Uh, question here. Dr. Coleman, thank you very much. Um, if you're going to medical school today, mm -hmm. have there been changes in the instructions on how to listen to women, treat women? I mean, has anything changed? <coughs> yeah, at I get that question a lot. I think there's a lot of interest now in making sure that women's health is not just an elective, right? Because 
I, you know, it's not that, that we have to really understand that it's not just about gynecology as it was for so much of our understanding, but that it's baked into the system, woven into the tapestry of how we care for women. I think there are definitely more advocates about this and more, it's definitely being brought up in, in medical schools. People are talking about developing new curriculums. So I think it's there, but um, interestingly, there was just uh, a mandate that came out yesterday that you will have to have consent for doing a pelvic exam. So if a woman is going for a gynecologic surgery and is under anesthesia, she could have a pelvic exam by a medical student, by a resident, without her consent. That, that's been going on for forever. That's how we did it in med school. Only now will you have to actually consent to that before you go to the operating room. And then down here. Um, recently, <clears throat> first of all, thank you. It was really enlightening. Re recently, I went to a lecture on focused ultrasound therapy. And admittedly, it was really talking about using it on the brain, but the doctor <coughs> presenting said that this is in the nascent, it's a nascent field, and that it could be used for other forms of cancer. Um, is that anything that ever comes up in breast cancer research? So there's all sorts of different modalities that people are talking about. Um, I'm not as familiar with that, but um, it certainly sounds interesting. But I don't know as much about that. It's, 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 it's in the research realm, but yeah. I think people, yeah, absolutely. And down here. Yes, uh, Daniel Gilmer, Pfizer, Rockefeller alum. Um, and I have to say, it is really inspiring, the consistency of how you show up in the personal world, uh, professional world. Our daughters, as you know, do ballet together. Um, and so when I think about our daughters, though, um, could you comment a bit on AI and the impact it may have to a lot of what you're speaking to today? Um, and then also just, you know, currently being at Pfizer, your point around the CPT codes, I had never really thought about, and it's just so remarkably important how much that plays into the value prop. But yeah, AI and the impact for the future with our daughters. You wanna you wanna answer that? Because uh, uh, we're because because yeah. we work together, you answer yeah, so, it. Yeah. So so um, as as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, we uh, at some point when we both started our careers, we kept, we met up and we said, wouldn't it be amazing if we do something together? And we we sort of thought about um, we work in the lab. But then I asked Elizabeth, like, what, where could we make an impact? And Elizabeth said, look, here's a problem. Here's an important problem. The important problem is mammography. Like, you know, all women are having mammograms. Nearly every woman will have an abnormal mammogram in her life. And it's incredibly stressful. I know my mother had it, my, you know, and, and all, of us, um, all of us know women who've had the abnormal mammogram. Then they undergo a biopsy and... It, it could take two weeks to figure out whether the biopsy is shows cancer or not. And for the majority of cases, it, sh it shows non-cancer. But you have to wait. You have to go get an intervention. And it's stressful. It's psychologically taxing. And so Elizabeth said, is there a way that we could maybe work together to see if we could figure out which women actually have cancer versus not? And could we do it earlier? So a long time ago, it, it's been a long project. It's been very challenging. We set out to see if maybe from the blood of these women who, are about, who have an abnormal mammogram, whether we could take their blood and we could look for molecules in their blood. We didn't know which molecules, but we thought <laughs> maybe we work in RNA. Some of these small RNAs we see in the blood. Could, is it possible that maybe their breast cancers are releasing tiny little bits of RNA in the blood and we could look for it? So with Elizabeth's incredible help, uh, I said she's a force of nature, we were able to over the past seven years, recruit over 500 women at Sloan Kettering. So this has been a real collaboration between us. We get the samples from the women at Sloan Kettering, blood samples, and we run them over to- um, Literally run uh, them over. Literally run them over uh, on ice to Rockefeller University. Our scientists here take them, they get small RNAs, and then we look at them. And then, um, and then your point about AI, we were seeing differences and we were clear differences. We could see, oh, this woman, the women who had breast cancer versus the ones that had benign disease, we could see differences. Um, uh, but uh, we didn't have a sense of how we could parse it very well. And in the past few years, AI came online. So we sort of jumped on it and said, is it possible that we could use machine learning uh, and AI to, to learn from the women who had cancer versus the ones that didn't, and we knew what the biopsy showed later, and then take women who are just coming in now, and then could we figure out which ones have cancer versus not? And, uh, and, and we've been able to get there. Uh, we haven't published it yet, but we're basically able to see that 
uh, we can accurately predict uh, which women actually have cancer versus ones that do not. Um, and the idea is that perhaps um, this could be commercialized and one, what, what, what could happen is a woman has an abnormal mammogram, they get a blood test right away, and perhaps the next day uh, they could be told, don't worry about it. It's 99%, it's, it's not cancer, but you know, next year we'll see you again to have your annual mammogram. Or, hey, this looks concerning, go get your biopsy. And what's cool about that is if you get rid of the 70% of women who are not going to have cancer, you're not going to open up the line so that the women who do have cancer can get their biopsies faster, they can get treated faster, and the psychological issues go away. And then the other thought is maybe in, in underserved areas in the, in the world, who, 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 individuals who don't have access to imaging and mammograms, perhaps this could be used to just as a blood test, um, perhaps in the future. So this is the type of thing that came out as a result of, of, of discussions uh, with Elizabeth a long time ago, and it couldn't have been done without AI interfacing with science here at Rockefeller, interfacing with an incredible clinician across the street. There's no way in hell we could have done any of this if it wasn't for Elizabeth being able to recruit amazing women who are willing to give some blood and also healthy volunteers that, that we could get this information from. So this is why I think this, this area is really um, special because you have an incredible cancer center with incredible clinicians like Elizabeth, and then we have scientists here who are working on basic stuff and, and trying to find out could they apply it to some important problem. Um, and so, so th that's, the, that's the short, long answer to that. So a uh, question over here and then down here. Thank you, good morning, thank you. I'm Kara Pham, I'm also a Rockefeller alum and now on the faculty at Barnard College, which is a women's college, so we do think a lot about how we launch our students, women, into science and medicine. Um, you mentioned a long history of going to school together and maintaining collaborations and Dr. Komen as a breast oncologist and um, you know, so Hel running the laboratory of cancer metastasis. I'm wondering if there's any intersection about thinking about what metastasis looks like. Yeah. Uh, that, absolutely. So go. that's another. I, I don't want to. I don't want to take go. too much time. But no, we are. No, go do we it. Are, we're, we, these are areas that, with Elizabeth, we're actually working on, and many of the scientists from my lab are here, and we're. It's a major focus of our of our lab, and and uh, and and Marlene supports this this work from both of our labs, and so we're 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 critically we're we again based on our clinical expertise, we know that that's what kills women. So if we can identify cancers very early and, and uh, treat them and surgically resect them. But then at the same time, if we can then focus on the women who have cancers that can kill, understand why are they killing these women, or what are the genes they're turning on, and we can develop therapies against those genes. Um, the, 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 the goal is then to move it earlier to actually prevent metastatic relapse uh, and to achieve cures. And among the 500 patients that were talked about were recruited, some of those women had metastatic disease. So it was not just about early breast cancer patients and mammograms, but there's a cohort of women that had metastatic disease that also volunteered. And then, yes. Oh, okay, so this is, uh, just to let you know, this work has not yet been peer reviewed. It's not yet commercially available, and, and that, that can take some time. So we're, we're excited about it. We'd, we would, um, it's gonna be peer reviewed, and then uh, we would engage, um, uh, you know, other scientists to see how we can get this out as fast as possible. Um, but again, this takes time because you have to do quality control, you have to make sure, uh, do, do it in an independent site, you have to set up standards so that one institution doing it gets the same results as another institution doing it. Um, one thing I will say is that speaking of quality control, I've never seen a science, a scientist or a lab so focused on quality control. I mean, they, the number of samples that you know did not pass their their standard and that we had to do again was was pretty extraordinary. I mean, his le his bar for science is very high. Over there, yes. Hi, um, Anna Milosevic. I actually work here. <laughs> uh, I would like to loop back to advocacy for women's health. Um, and since I am in Alzheimer's research, and we know that women are much more prone to develop Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. um, I've been at the study section, and there were still huge obstacles in funding uh, research that includes more uh, 
female still mice, but mm -hmm. <laughs> female um, linked to Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's disease. And it's and these uh, this is among scientists. So um, it's I guess then even harder to um, not force but um, uh, let people understand that we need more female uh, oriented research. Mm -hmm. So what would be your um, advice to uh, bringing this awareness of um, uh, putting a lot more research and money into female um, oriented uh, research and diseases, not only female in research, but yeah. studying females in uh, research. I think it's conversations like this. I think it's whether it's the government and the White House initiative or really becoming part of advocacy groups involving, I mean, one thing with the breast cancer space that's been extraordinary is the, like the Breast Cancer Research Foundation or other foundations have huge platforms. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and they engage with scientists, right? So they, they fund our free research, for example. I think the more that we can have, not these siloed groups of private and philanthropy and academia, but really merge them, because there's large platforms and large groups of advocacy groups that want to be involved in research and want to help, inviting them to the table. You know, I was at ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, the other day, I'm on their Cancer Communications Committee, and I sat down, uh, I was seated with an advocate, right, to try to help also bridge what's relevant for the lay public to understand. So I think the more that we can have these conversations, I think there's a lot more interest among adv advocacy groups now and the lay public about talking about women's health. I think, we'll, I think we'll get there, but it has to be amplifying everybody's voice. And you're right, it isn't just about having w more women in, in medicine. It is about having more doctors like Sohail, though, and scientists like him. So, so I just want to follow up on that, sort of how do we get there? And I want to say that, um, you know, Elizabeth talked about our two different medical school programs. So we were the nerds, right? So my program was super nerds, like we can't really talk to patients very well. And then it's, it's a new pathway. These are, we, these are um, we, you know, these are individuals who, it's really interesting how at some point the decision was made for, to, with the admissions committee to start looking for hiring, you know, they have so many people who have great grades, right? The decision was made to look for people who are really leaders there. We, we used to have Broadway singers. We used to have amazing pe people who know history of medicine and history of science and people like Elizabeth. So the idea was if they could recruit people who have amazing grades, but also at the same time they have some other passion and interest that they've excelled at and they've taken things to another level. And that's, that's what Harvard began to do, and that's what a lot of our classmates were, amazing people who had this other passion and interest. And so what did that lead to, right? What that led to is re identification of someone like Elizabeth, who now writes this book. And this book opens my mind to lots of things I didn't know about, and, and raises dozens of biological questions, right, that we're not even thinking about, that scientists are not working on. These dozens of biological questions have tremendous impact and can give rise to new biology, new science, uh, you know, uh, help the economy, help employment. So it's all good, right? So I think what you need is you need individuals like her who are, um, who are seeing the patients, who, who understand the science, but who can look at the arc of history and who can see the current medical problems that are really not looked at and underlooked. And then talk to people like us, the scientists who are working in their labs who don't have the same broad perspective. For example, this, this whole question of mamma mammograms and tr identifying patients based on blood tests, we would not have done that were it not for Elizabeth to tell us, like, look, you can do it. Here's the patient population. We can get their blood samples. This is why it's important. It's a major psychological, it's tra traumatic to the patients to not have this. So I think you need people in the humanities, people in the arts, uh, who also have exposure to science and medicine. And I think that's what's really critical to get us to that stage of being at an Alzheimer's study section and, and having everybody say, of course, we need to have w female mice. Of course, that's even more important because it's, it's largely a disease uh, that's biased towards, towards women. Yeah, over there. Thanks. I actually am an advocate. <laughs> So this is great, but my question is about younger women that you're seeing with breast cancer. Do you see any correlation between egg or embryo freezing 
No, there's no data that, that the fertility treatments have increased the risk of breast cancer. Okay. But there is a rising incidence of cancer among young men and young women. I mean, the huge one is colorectal cancer, particularly for men under the age of 50, breast cancer for young women, as well as colon cancer. And we don't really know. There may be environmental factors that we don't know about. Um, you know, this is not for many of the patients that I see, but obesity is a huge problem in this country. Is there increasing, you know, fat cells that are making estrogen, that are changing the metabolic function of these women that are having, you know, these young girls that are going through puberty at age seven, age eight, age, age nine. We don't really understand what's going on there. And then there's a whole host of women under the age of 40 that we really don't know why, right? We don't know why, um, but, but it does not seem to be correlated to the fertility treatments. Okay. But great for the awareness of these young people who now need to look for this. Yes. Right. Thank you. Maybe we do two more questions. I know your time is precious. Yeah. Up there, then down here, and then over Thank there. you. Uh, you noted the remarkably higher incident of side effects in women um, in immunology and in, in um, cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. um, is, are there any theories for the difference? There are a lot of theories. I mean, in terms of everything from different uh, hormonal receptors to the fact that women's immune system tends to be revved up more. We suffer more from autoimmune diseases, right? So in some measure that can be protective for us. In other ways it can make us more symptomatic for other um, chemotherapy directed or cancer directed therapies, including immunotherapies. So those therapies are efficacious but toxic? Exactly. Over there, <clears throat> and then last question here. This is excellent. Um, when we started, you talked about the sort of women's equity. What about thinking about women's, um, under-resourced women, and how, if these women's issues take more time, you're paid less, how, are there any scalable ideas that you all have, or how do we think about lots of our, even New York City population, and how to help them, those less-resourced women with these issues? Yeah, I mean, I, one of the themes that's in my book is certainly that it's not just misogyny, but racism and other issues with minorities really compound access to health care. Um, black women, for example, are 40% more likely to die from breast cancer than any other ethnicity, and that's not does not appear related to higher incidence necessarily of more aggressive cancers like triple negative breast cancer, but really access to resources. I think one of the things that you're talking about is how do we not only have better health care, but also equitable health care across the board, and it's a huge, huge, huge problem in terms of pockets of New York City, pockets of this country, rural America, the South, um, where you just, you, sometimes you don't even have providers to be there. And that, the problem with that, and certainly in other parts of the country, is, is the political landscape. If you look at the South, you have, you have gynecologists fleeing some of those communities because they can't provide the kind of ethical care that they want to in terms of reproductive health. So you really see the intersection of politics, economics, culture, religion in terms of access to care. Uh, I don't, I don't have any answers for that, but I think bringing more awareness to it is is a, is a, the only place to start. And the last question over. I wanted to circle back a little bit about into the insurance issues because sometimes when you have a new therapy that's a lot less toxic and a lot better. The insurance companies won't let you use it as a first-line drug. So you, mm -hmm. you're talking about quality of life of your patients, but if you know that there is a much less toxic drug that you can't give, that the insurance companies won't pay for as initially, and you have to give a more toxic treatment, how do you deal with that? Do you do you refuse? Do you give the better drug? Do you go well, along with the insurance world? No, I think I think one of the reasons why doctors are pulled out of the exam room is because they're often fighting with insurance companies. I don't think that the average public realizes, and I don't put this against them, how much time is spent on prior authorizations or arguing with a doctor that's never seen your patient, sending them journal articles to say this is the right treatment. I think usually we're able to get what we want for patients, but sometimes it's it's not even necessarily the right treatment, but something that's a little bit easier. So for example, Herceptin pertuzumab, these are drugs that, that we give in the breast cancer space that can be given by infusion or by a shot. They're, it's a lot easier to get the shot for some patients. Some patients prefer the infusion, but they may not have that choice. Some insurance agencies will not cover for a simple shot. They want the time in the infusion chair because that generates more money in some instances, or the hospital may want that in some instances. I'm not saying Memorial Sloan Kettering, that's not how we operate, 
but that's an example of where sometimes there's a discrepancy in the care because it's the same efficacy, but one is easier on the patient than the other. Fantastic. So let's give a round of applause to Elizabeth. Thanks so much.